time and there are others uh, that need to testify, but I'll let you ask your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a quick question. The resolution um, that you submitted specifically mentions the Medicare for All Act um, submitted by Representative or Jayapal or sponsored by um, Representative Pramila Jayapal. And I was wondering why you picked um, to submit the resolution specifically uh, mentioning that bill, since I know that there are a number of Medicare for All proposals out there. Um, and so I was wondering why specifically um, Representative Jayapal's uh, proposal. Thank you. Um, I might be able to take that unless somebody else. Um, that That's the major proposal for Medicare for All. In fact, that is the only proposal I know that's on the floor in the House um, for Medicare for All. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, there, there were past versions of Medicare for All. Um, Representative Conyers for, for decades was the champion of a single payer Medicare for All system. And he had a bill that used to be referred to. Um, He's no longer there, and Representative Jayapal's bill just happens to be the, the single payer Medicare for all bill. There, there is no other single payer Medicare for all bill that I'm aware of. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, coincidentally, before this meeting, I was looking at healthcare.gov and trying to unravel the various options related to small businesses as I'm uh, part of a small business. There is the small business health options program. There's flexible spending accounts. There's health reimbursement accounts. There's all of these different things and it's, it is maddening. Um, but I wanted to ask about the city of New Haven and, you know, given how large an expense healthcare is for the city, it's 14% of the budget as proposed this year. Uh, it's $85 million, but you also mentioned the potential for payroll taxes. And so I was wondering if you could speak even in broad terms about how this would affect the city budget and what, you know, would residents in New Haven uh, see if in a world where everything else was held constant, would they see taxes go up? Would they see taxes go down uh, at the municipal level, right? The, the property taxes. Uh, sure. No, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, uh, so overall, the expenses will be reduced because um, the, the revenue, so as I mentioned, um, the savings, there's substantial savings to implementing Medicare for All, and um, that um, the financing options for the revenue um, have been crafted such that they are the payroll tax or individual income tax will be lower than the healthcare premiums that are currently being paid. And so um, sometimes you just hear the the tax part of the payroll tax. Um, the payroll tax will, um, by definition of how this bill is crafted, will be uh, lower than what the premiums are currently paid. Um, and if there, there, are, there are several options that have been proposed. Um, the, uh, and depending on which ones are implemented, um, you can, even, even if, the, so for instance, there's um, uh, very high, so the very, very wealthy will see their taxes um, increase, to be honest, but that is not going to impact the vast, vast majority of people or employers. Um, and so, you know, middle class families will be paying less, they won't be paying premiums, there'll be no medical bills. Um, and if, if you want to look in this in detail um, about how we both calculated the projecting costs and savings um, and to um, look at how to tailor a financing plan, um, we developed an online tool called SHIFT, um, which stands for Single Payer Healthcare Interactive Financing Tool. And it's, um, it's free open access and, you know, I encourage um, 
any of you to to check it out. And if you have any questions about it, I'd be happy to. Um, I could send you the link, perhaps to. Um, but you can also find it at. Um, let's see. Well, let me just pull up the link. Sorry, you want to go on to the next question while I. Oh yeah, sorry, James, go ahead. Sorry, just to add on to that, for the city of New Haven, I, I know there are some people lined up to testify who can probably speak to that directly in terms of just the city of New Haven. But the overall picture is, if the city of New Haven is spending around $80 million on health care for its employees, which is something like correct, um, that expense will be completely gone. And the new expense that will be created will be a payroll tax. So what you're gonna wind up doing, because the city pays a payroll tax on its own employees, what all the calculations show for any city, um, given the high cost of healthcare and raising, rising cost of healthcare to all municipalities, is that you will save a tremendous amount of money. I know that um, 1199 was mentioned, we have Bill Morico lined up to testify who was a state healthcare analyst and was an analyst for 1199 and has looked at this stuff in more detail. So um, he might be able to give you some specific numbers, but the overall picture is it saves municipalities an incredible amount of money as municipalities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, now we will uh, call upon the, uh, the next following uh, six individuals. We'll just bring them in the bullpen here. Um, and if I do uh, pronounce your name wrong, please correct me uh, as you enter uh, into the room. Uh, Yesenia Rodriguez, Sivan Amar, Tanvi Varma, Bill Marico, Mary Saitek. Sarah Sayano, and Guadalupe Garcia. As you all enter into the room, uh, you'll be given access to turn on your videos. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask that you state your first and last name and your address, your actual address, uh, for the record. Uh, in the order that I called you in. So Yesenia, is Yesenia here? Yes. Okay. Uh, you may say your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Yesenia Rodriguez and I live at 87 Fulton Street, New Haven, Connecticut, 06513. Okay, you may uh, give your testimony. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chesenia Rodriguez, and I am a leader in Connecticut Drivers United. We are a nonprofit organization founded by Uber and Lyft drivers. For the good of Uber and Lyft drivers, we stand together for dignity and good standards. As a Uber and Lyft drivers, we have very few rights. The big companies treat us as an independent contractor, not employees. So we do not have the same rights as all the workers. For example, we do not get paid minimum wage over time, and we have to fight for unemployment or work and compensation. One of the biggest problems we face as a driver is getting health insurance. Neither Uber or Lyft give us any health insurance benefits whatsoever. Even though many of us are working 40, 50, or 60 hours a week, some of us qualify for Husky, which is good, but many more struggle to afford private insurance. This is a bad situation. Some drivers just never go to the doctors, which means they will get sicker and sicker. If they could have gone to the doctor in the first place, they might not get sick. Other drivers use the emergency room as their doctor, which is not good either. People should not have to go to the emergency room unless they have a real emergency. People think it is easy to sit in a car and drive all day, but it's not. And it's not an easy or healthy way to make a living without access to the advice of a doctor. It is hard for drivers to live in a healthy life. 
Medicare for, for all is the best solution to this problem of not having health insurance. First of all, Medicare for all will provide health insurance to every person in New Haven, no questions asked. We will not have to go to social service to find out if we qualify or hope that Uber or Lyft will change their policy. We will know that we have health insurance. Second, Medicare for all will eliminate all premiums and co-pays in other countries. People do not have to pay money because they are sick. They can just go to the doctor. We should not have to either. Um, please support this resolution in support of Medicare for all. We will back you up all the way if you do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your powerful testimony. Uh, are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for, again, your uh, most powerful testimony on tonight. Um, I'm looking for person number four. Uh, you have numbers in front of your names. Sivan. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Yep, if you can state your name and address for the record. Yvonne Amar, 18 Mechanic Street, New Haven, Apartment 1. Thank you. You may uh, give your testimony. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, to the New Haven Board of Alders Health and Human Services Committee, my name is Sivan. I'm in New Haven, Ward 9. I'm a founding incorporating member and board member of Medicare for All Connecticut. We're an activist organization seeking to enshrine Medicare for all into law at the local, national, and state level. We are one of the co-endorsing organizations of tonight's event, along with Central Connecticut DSA, Connecticut Drivers United, who just gave that wonderful testimony, Connecticut Working Families Party, NARAL Pro-Choice Connecticut, New Haven's People Center, Our Revolution Connecticut, Quiet Corner DSA, Sunrise Movement New Haven, Students for a National Health Plan and Western Connecticut DSA. Uh, we at Medicare for All wish to thank you very much for hosting us tonight to discuss this increasingly important issue that affects us all in New Haven and across America. In his speech delivered to the joint session of Congress last night, President Biden called healthcare a human right. Um, in a recent talk given to members of the Connecticut organizing group Indivisible Shoreline, State Senator and Deputy Majority Leader of the Connecticut State Senate, Matt Lesser, called healthcare a human right. It is now time for our local officials in New Haven to recognize that healthcare is a human right. We therefore endorse and advocate for a New Haven Medicare for All resolution to be adopted by our Board of Alders and subsequently passed through the Connecticut legislative process to become law for all Connecticut residents. In this time of economic and health crises, our current system of tying healthcare access to a person's job or personal affordability has shown to be woefully inadequate. If someone feels sick with COVID symptoms but cannot afford to miss work for fear of losing their health benefits, the irony of the situation has proven itself clearly. Additionally, marrying healthcare access to a job restricts an individual's freedom of choice as their coverage is at the whim of their employer if the employers can even afford to elect employer-sponsored health care. This is not even to mention the insurance companies themselves refusing coverage, skyrocketing, skyrocketing premiums, deductibles, co-pays, et cetera, all motivated by profit and not for an individual's actual health and well-being. In a recent study conducted by the Massachusetts Medical Society during COVID, a staggering 44% of small businesses reported their health benefits packages being at risk during these unprecedented times. As an employee myself of a small business uh, and in no way whatsoever affiliated with Yale, for instance, or other large corporations, I would fall into this category and can very easily at my employer's whim, lose my coverage and start to accrue medical debt that would prevent me from say, investing in New Haven, such as buying a home here as I wish to do. Uh, furthermore, keeping healthcare as a job benefit does not ensure that a family or an individual covered by those plans won't fall into medical debt. In fact, research has shown that nearly two thirds 
of debt in America is attributed to medical bills. And that's from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, January 2017. That's before COVID. Recently, the Distinguished New Haven Board of Elders passed a resolution stating that racism is a public health crisis. Therefore, it should be noted that anti-racism and health equity are key aspects of the New Haven Medicare for All resolution. The high rate of medical debt collection in communities of color, the high rate of uninsurance and underinsurance in communities of color, and the exclusion of undocumented people from public insurance programs has created a veritable racist health crisis in our own city, even before COVID disproportionately affected and continues affect these racial and ethnic minority groups. According to Data Haven, a nonprofit organization based in New Haven collecting data on our city's well-being, equity, and quality of life. 2018 data shows that 31% of New Haven's population is obese, 21% is suffering from food insecurity, another 10% report housing insecurity, and a full 28% report being underemployed. Additionally, a whopping 53% of New Haven residents stated in 2019 that they are in a cost-burdened household. All of these combine to really compel us to need uh, a solution to our profit-driven uh, healthcare system right now. To put it bluntly, a single-payer system such as Medicare for All will relieve some of the financial stress New Haven and her residents are currently facing. Annually, New Haven spends over $85 million per year on employee health care. So shifting to a system that eliminates the profit incentives and puts the people of Connecticut and New Haven in charge of determining costs and health services would greatly reduce the city's cost burden. This would also have the added benefit of reducing city taxes on those residents of certain income brackets while shifting the burden more evenly onto those who can more afford it and should contribute more to their fellow residents and, and citizenry. Though a tax might increase, the premiums, deductibles, co-pays, out-of-pockets, all of that would be gone. So you might pay 500 more in taxes, but you'd have zero to pay for anything else. So I would take that, that instead. Um, Though I only touch upon the most pressing topics that Medicare for All in New Haven would correct, I implore this committee to take up this issue of endorsing the proposed resolution in order to ensure we as a community demonstrate through our actions that we hold dear the health and well-being of our neighbors, that we actually wish to implement the tenets of a just society, and prove that we can begin to change the effects of the public health crisis that is racism. Uh, I wish to thank the Health and Human uh, Services Committee of New Haven for your time and consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. We will now hear from uh, who's number five here. Oh, okay, you know. Okay, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so my name is Sanvi Varma and I live on 123 Oryx Street, Unit 3C, New Haven. So like I said, my name is Sanvi Varma. I am a second year medical student at the Yale School of Medicine and I'm one of the co-leaders of our school's chapter of Students for a National Health Program. So as medical students, we spend hours learning about medications, about random infectious diseases, about anatomy, about pathophysiology because we're told that the health of our patients lies solely in our hands and in our knowledge. But it's become so clear so quickly that that's not true at all. What about patients who need our help but can't get it because they're uninsured? And we're faced with this question every day in the hospital. So just the other day, um, I met a patient who had diabetes and they needed insulin. And me and my team of doctors and residents and interns, we were here discussing the exact dosage of insulin and the exact brand of insulin that we wanted to give. But the reality is, is that that patient could have walked out of the door with our prescription, but not been able to fill it because it was too expensive. Similarly, one of my, my best friends in medical school during her first week of medical school met a patient in the ED. And she was told by her um, attending doctor to listen to his heart. And so when she took her stethoscope and listened to his heart, she heard a murmur, which in a young guy, the patient was young, he was 30 years old, is pretty uncommon. And so when she asked the doctor what was going on, he said that the patient was gonna die. And he was gonna die because 
he had a congenital heart defect as a kid and it could have actually been solved and addressed. He could have had surgery as a kid and this would no longer be a problem. But because he was uninsured, his family was uninsured, his family was undocumented, he was unable to get the care he needed as a kid. And now the issue was not reversible. There was nothing that could be done for him. So him as a 30 year old young man who potentially had 50 plus years of life left to live was gonna be denied that because he didn't have health insurance as a child. And so I and so many of my classmates went to medical school to help people lead healthy and fulfilling lives. But that's not possible if our patient, patients don't have access to healthcare. And so I'm here to see, say that as future health professionals, we support Medicare for all. Historically, doctors did not support Medicare for all. In fact, historically, we've had a really bad record as, as physicians and as future physicians in advocating for healthcare for all. But our generation is different. We take it as our duty to not only learn all the medications and all the medicine that we need to learn, but also to advocate for our patients and advocate for a just and equitable healthcare system. So I thank you for your time and I hope that you all support the passing of our Medicare, Medicare for All resolution in New Haven. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we are now moving to Bill Morico. Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, William Marico, official name. You can call me Bill, as you do. Uh, 470 Ellsworth Avenue, Ward 28, New Haven. Um, I'll try, I'm trying not to cover things that have been covered already. Um, I'm here representing New Haven People Center. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't need to give you a background on the People Center, most of you. So, um, I'm also a board member of the Fairhaven Community Health Center and have been for over 20 years. Um, so that's where really a lot of this rubber hits the road, uh, very frankly. Um, over 20% of the patients at Fairhaven Community Health are, are uninsured, most of them undocumented. Um, Hill Health Center has a lower percentage, but still significant percentage of, uh, of uninsured patients. Under federal law, everyone is entitled to services at a, at a federally, federally qualified health center, even if they are undocumented. Um, there is a site sliding fee scale, which we have to approve every year, uh, which has a minimum payment of $25, which we never collect from most people. Um, there's still though a stigma for undocumented people of getting care even though they're entitled to it at a federally qualified health center. Um, that's why there's such a thing as the Haven Free Clinic, um, which some other people on the call are involved in. Even with those services though, people who we see who are uninsured and people by the way, who are on Medicaid and have Husky, all the different Husky programs, still have a real problem accessing specialty care, accessing lab services, um, radiology services, all kinds of specialty services, and they have to be referred to specialists and to hospitals. And if they don't have funds, they don't have insurance. And even if they have Husky, it's difficult for our providers to find access for those services for patients. And if we do find access, those people then, if they go to Yale, New Haven, uh, have to jump through hoops and the hospital advertises, and rightly so, by the way, this is part of the benefits agreement that 1199 negotiated a number of years ago. Uh, charitable care, patients could jump through hoops to access that, that money, but they have to jump through hoops. And it's a very demeaning process to actually get that care. Uh, so that's why we need Medicare for all, one of the reasons. The other things that have been stated, Medicare for all is not the Medicare that I'm on now, by the way. I want everybody to have the coverage I have. I'm a retired state employee, okay? Um, when I worked for 1199, I was active in healthcare workers union. I helped negotiate their benefits. I became the director of their health and welfare plan. I then left to go to work for the state of Connecticut, administering benefits for state employees, the health benefits. Part of that job was negotiating with the scum called health insurance companies. 
<laughs> very frankly. Even though we're self-insured now, we still have to deal with them because of the fee-for-service system. Um, Kevin Lembo is trying to deal with that. Legislation is trying to deal with that with the single payer option in Connecticut. I urge the board to support that also. The, so Medicare for all would cover all kinds of things that are not covered by current Medicare, cover mental health care, cover behavioral health care, um, would cover medical, dental, prescription coverage and long-term care. Long-term care is not covered by Medicare it is covered if you can pay yourself or for most people, like 80% of people in Connecticut in, medic in, in nursing homes are covered by Medicaid. Where does Medicaid money come from? It's federal and state money, which comes from our taxes. The Medicare all, for all bill that's in Congress now would, that's been introduced in the house would take all of that money that goes for all of these federal health programs, Medicaid, Husky, uh, birth to three, women's and infants programs, all of these different health programs, put them into one pot. And that would be Medicare for all. In addition, there would be higher taxes on individuals. There'd be higher taxes on corporations, hopefully. But that would fund it. As other speakers have said, Dr. Galvani has spoken, overall, the cost should be lower because everyone is paying somewhat for that cost. In terms of the cost, there's other issues which are involved in this. Part of the Medicare for All bill that's in Congress provides for global budgeting for healthcare institutions so that instead of being on a fee-for-service basis like all hospital care is now, right, where you have, I don't know how many coders there are at Yale New Haven Hospital and people who have to administer health insurance plans, but that would all be unnecessary because of global budgeting. The hospital and all other hospitals and, and institutions would get a global budget annually, get paid quarterly in advance, by the way, based on their past costs, and then it would be adjusted going forward. So that we actually, over a period of time, should see a lessening of healthcare costs, not just due to the um, elimination of co-pays and deductibles, but because the hospitals themselves can be more efficient. I would love to see more nurses at Yale New Haven Hospital being able to spend time taking care of patients rather than have to deal with health insurance companies. For those of you who wait, in, how many of you wait in line at the pharmacy for your pharmacist to talk to or to get your prescription filled? Well, half of their time is spent on the phone with insurance companies getting approval for prescriptions. You wouldn't have to wait in line, small benefit probably, but um, the, uh, just employer, to answer some of the questions that were asked before, for employers, if employers didn't have to pay for healthcare benefits directly the way they do now, there would be a huge savings. In addition to the money they would save, by the way, that would be offset because they would have increased taxes and they would have employees would have a payroll tax. But for employers, one of the big benefits would be that they no longer have to have their HR departments deal with all of the problems that exist with health insurance. HR departments spend a lot of time dealing with their employees, not just with the premiums and collecting the premiums and arguing with employees about how much it costs, but also about their coverage. Um, and that would all be eliminated. It would be a national program. It's not an employer-based program. And that's something that I think employers have to look at. Um, I'm gonna uh, basically um, cut off. I just have one suggestion. Uh, and, the, and the issue was raised, I believe, um, earlier um, by Alder Saban, I think. Uh, in terms of Medicare for All Act, the specific act that's measured in the mentioned in the resolution, I would suggest a change to the resolution. Um, one of the, there, the therefore resolved, and I would change it to say, now therefore be it resolved that the New Haven Board of Alders enthusiastically supports the, and then I insert principles embodied in the Medicare for All Act instead of just the Medicare for All Act. Um, and, and work towards enactment of those principles. Um, 
And that's because all of you know, just as better than most of us, the vagaries of how legislation works and federal legislation. That bill will be amended, will be changed, may be substituted. Um, so that I think there's a real danger in saying, okay, the board is in favor of this specific bill needs to be in favor of supporting the, the principles that are embodied in that bill. So that if other bills do the same thing, the board doesn't have to have another resolution. So I appreciate that thank actually. You thank you. I appreciate that. And actually uh, Alder Saban or any member of the committee, if we could take note of uh, that suggestion, uh, because like I said, this is gonna be a process. Uh, I actually um, I greatly appreciate this. And uh, actually I, my dad would kill me <laughs> if I didn't say this, you are like a legend in my home. Uh, he was uh, 1199 Union Stewart back in the day at Atrium Plaza um, uh, with, with the union. And um, uh, thank you for your work <laughs> um, uh, many, many years later, but uh, your work is much appreciated uh, and certainly in the Brackeen household. Next, um, uh, we have testimony from Mary uh, Sayek. Hey, excuse me. Hi. Please state your name and address for the record. Hey, how's it going? Good. I'm Mary Cytek. I live at 110 Hemlock Road, New Haven, Connecticut, 06515 in Ward 26. I am constituent of Alter Brackeen. Thanks for having me today. Bill, what you said about nurses and pharmacists is a great segue for what I want to talk about. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about what Medicare for all would mean to a clinician. I'm, I've been worked at Yelma Haven Hospital for uh, for 10 years and I've been a nurse practitioner with a surgical service there for about five years. Um, part of my job is literally to appeal procedures and imaging uh, services that surgeons think medically necessary that get denied by for-profit insurance. I call up on the phone, and I make the case and try to get these, these procedures and in, in MRIs say approved. Um, I wanna tell you about a couple of patients um, briefly. I have a patient, we had a patient in his thirties. He was in a car accident. He had a lower extremity trauma with pain that nobody could explain. He healed, he exhausted all the services. No one could explain where this pain was coming from and nothing would help it. He exhausted everybody, came to us finally, just looking for an amputation. Dramatic, but this guy was, was hurting and was out of options. He, if insurance denied, sorry, not indicated. I, I called, I made the appeal, denied. We had to go back and build our case over time. Eventually he got his amputation. Months later, he walks into clinic on his prosthetic and he had a great outcome. He was, he was very happy. Um, but he suffered needlessly for months because uh, for something that Medicare would have covered. Uh, I, I don't have this kind of conversation with people who are covered by Medicare. Um, I also have a fellow who he's in his 50s. He works at the police station. He has varicose veins. He has uh, symptomatic advanced varicose vein disease. Um, he's failed conservative measures. Um, and he is in need of a simple outpatient procedure to close the offending vein um, to, and that would relieve his symptoms. Uh, all he wants to do is take his motorcycle up to Maine and spend a few days up there and relax. And he can't because his leg is driving him crazy. It is so itchy. And I've been working on this one for about a year, a year and a half. Um, he is scheduled. I'm hoping it, it's, it finally, it's finally gonna get done this time. Um, but until it happens, they could just pull the right out from under it at any point, just say, oh, denied. And he, we have to start again. Um, so that, those are just two examples. And I have more. I've been there for five years. I've got lots of examples of, of how the, the system is not working for so many people who have coverage. Um, you know, the second guy has Blue Cross Blue Shield. I mean, it just, it's terrible. Um, I want to tell you about how for patients with for-profit insurance, what insurance will and will not cover informs, I would say almost half of the patient visits that I have, where patients say are trying to schedule surgery and they have to say, well, you know, I wanna get my aneurysm repaired, but you know, I think I'm gonna be leaving my job in June. Do you think we could do it in May? And, and they, they have to plan their lives around this, around the, the, around their, their, the, the profit of their, their for-profit insurance. 
Um, it, there's also times when people say, oh, you know, I think my father really needs to go to rehab after this. And, I, you know, and we have to, you know, well, well insurance, is, is insurance going to cover it? And that that informs that decision making. It's it's incredibly frustrating that that the patient's needs aren't put first. Uh, I feel like, um, you know, people here know much more about this than, than me, but it seems like insurance companies have been making doing very well during COVID. And I feel like those needs and the needs of those shareholders are, are forever being put in front of patients' needs. And I'm a big supporter of Medicare for all, um, for all these reasons. I, I thank you for, for listening to me and I'd, I'd love to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and your service uh, to the community. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, next we have Sarah Sayano. Please state your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Sarah Sayano, and that was very good, Alder Burkeen. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I live at 55 Hall Street in New Haven in Ward 18, and um, I am a Yale retiree, a proud member of Local 34 at Yale. Um, right now I'm here. Um, took place relatively because I am a steering committee member on um, Our Revolution Connecticut. And um, so we've heard real lot of very important data. I'm gonna speak a little bit more to the personal side of things. Mary kind of touched on it a little bit just now too, but um, my, my personal story is about a, a close family member who is, um, has uh, chosen uh, the career of music in his life. So um, he's actually a graduate of the Juilliard School in New York City, uh, beautiful musician, um, has never had health care. Uh, people who choose other career paths other than those that typically also offer health care as, you know, as a benefit of employment many times have to choose to say no to those deep inner drives of their lives, um, gifts that they have. And I'm sure there are many people in our city who have those kinds of gifts and who have decided to put them aside because they need to get good jobs with good health care because that's the only way they can get it. This person in my family has struggled without it you know, struggled really hard to take good care of his health so he wouldn't need it, knock on wood, it's worked out okay. Now he has a little bit of health care through the state of Connecticut, but every time he turns around, the provider is not on his list. The provider is, is not on his list. So um, it's awful that, you know, I would be, how much better would it be everybody, all doctors and nurses and so forth, were part of the system. All the doctors were part of, were providers. You didn't have to worry about which doctors were providers. They would all be providers. You don't have to worry about whether your doctors are available or on your list or in your state or all of these questions would not exist. People would simply have health care wherever they go, with whatever doctors they choose. And in the end, for less money than they pay now, saving the city an enormous amount of money in itself, our city of New Haven, we don't have the money to waste, to simply say we're gonna, you know, pay for healthcare when, you know, it's a lot of money. Do we have money to waste in the city of New Haven? I don't think so. So I ask as a resident and a taxpayer and a, res, you know, a real estate taxpayer and, you know, concerned citizen and a, you know, family member of the person I just spoke to, that you really deeply consider simply signing on to this non-binding resolution to promote the concept that our country should be working towards a single payer Medicare for all system and that you stand behind the idea that our representatives in DC, in federal government, should be standing behind that for us, 
too. And that's what I have to say to you. Thank you so much for your powerful and convincing testimony. Uh, any questions from members of the committee? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much. And thank you all uh, that we have slated for this first workshop on this item. Uh, due to the fact that we, uh, this committee, has another probably two and a half hours <laughs> of uh, hearings concerning our federal block grants, of which uh, we have many adoring uh, and needy uh, organizations um, uh, we, we need to disperse these funds to. I'm going to entertain a, a motion uh, from a member of the committee uh, to um, uh, recess uh, and reconvene uh, this workshop until uh, an appointed time. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we recess and reconvene at an appointed time. Hearing that, do I hear a second? Second. Hearing that being moved and second, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, aye. All that object, all that object, please say nay. Uh, any abstentions? Uh, we will reconvene and recess. Uh, I will say at this time, uh, for the public's sake, I'm sure there are many members of the public that are wishing to testify, and we actually really want uh, to provide you that space and time. Um, and uh, so please email your testimonies ahead of time in advance to public testimony at newhavenct.gov. And I'll repeat that public testimony at newhavenct.gov. And uh, we will be working uh, actually with you all <laughs> to uh, find an appointed time to reconvene, reconvene specifically on this type this title and uh, this topic resolution uh, for an extended time, uh, uh, for a longer time even, uh, so that we can continue to hear all the voices of the community as we need to on this very vital subject. Uh, hearing that moved as a recess, um, members of the committee, you may take, I think we'll start at 7.30. You have a few minutes. Um, uh, feel free to come back at 7.30 promptly and I'll read the public notice. Thank you. Is it 